This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. It's time for our series, Reimagine Chicago. It's a collaboration between our show and the University of Chicago's Center for Effective Government at the Harris School of Public Policy. Now, this spring and summer, we are examining four institutions and systems that play a pivotal role in our civic life. That's city government, community investment, public safety, and schools. And we're reimagining how they could work better for Chicago residents. Today, a thought leader on urban life joins us to discuss what types of investment can help cities develop quickly, but also equitably, and what's needed for cities to thrive. Richard Florida is an urbanist, journalist, writer, and researcher. He's university professor at the University of Toronto's School of Cities and Rotman School of Management, and he's a distinguished fellow at New York University's Shack School of Real Estate. He's also author of the books The Rise of the Creative Class and How It's Transforming Work, Leisure, Community, and Everyday Life. And The New Urban Crisis, How Our Cities Are Increasing Inequality, Deepening Segregation, and Failing the Middle Class, and What We Can Do About It. Hi, Richard. Welcome to Reset. Oh, man, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. Thank you for for making the time. I want to start out, Richard, with what sounds like a basic question, but it's it's might not be as easy to answer as some may think. And that is, what is a city? And what does a thriving city actually look Uh, like? uh, That's actually a very difficult question. Um, But but let me give you the the simple answer. Most people think of a city as the city of Chicago, the municipality, or the city of New York, or the city of Los Angeles. But if you think like an urbanist, Urbanists tend to think of, or if you look at the definition, of a metropolitan area. So when you think of a metropolitan area, that is the city of Chicago, its surrounding suburbs, its exurbs, and even a little bit of its rural areas. The, the reason urbanists think that way is because that's the labor market. That, that's the commuting shed in which people live and work and go about their daily lives. So I think that's probably the best definition of a city. Okay. What does a thriving city look like? Well, you know, a thriving city is a place that that I think provides great economic opportunity for its residents. If we go back to this idea of a metropolitan area being a labor market where people live and work and, and have a home, pay their bills, I think a thriving city is one that provides economic opportunity for all of its residents. Now, let me let me tell folks out there, the, the United Nations in the past several years created actually a goal for cities. They've always had sustainable development goals for a good environment or a prosperous planet, but they actually created a specific goal for cities, and that's called Sustainable Development Goal 11. And that goal says, I think it's a perfect definition of a thriving city for any city in the world. It says a, a great city or a thriving city or what they call a human settlement should be a place that's safe, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. So it it ensures the safety of its residents. It makes sure people have great economic opportunity and are included. It's not horribly unequal or unaffordable. Mm -hmm. It's sustainable in that it protects its environment. It's resilient that it can take shocks, economic shocks or natural disasters or health shocks like the COVID crisis. I think that's a pretty good definition of a thriving city. This is a very solemn week right now, Richard, as we remember George Floyd and we remember his life and how his murder impacted our world. And so I wonder, as someone who is dedicated to understanding and visualizing cities, did the social revolution that was born from Mr. Floyd's death, did that change your perspective in any way? Yeah, I I think it did. I I think, you know, I, I became an urbanist because in the year 1967, my hometown of Newark, New Jersey, as a very young boy, exploded into civil disturbance or what was then called, I'm making air quotes, listeners, riots. Uh, I was driving with my dad. My dad was taking me to the Newark Public Library, and uh, I saw my city in flames. I, we actually heard gunshots. Uh, my dad told me to get down on the floor of his Chevy Impala. Um, and police pulled us over and said, turn around, you know, go back wherever you were coming from. And uh, I saw literally tanks and and the National Guard occupying my city. So that frame, that's the reason I became an urbanist. Um, but this summer I saw something different, uh, oh, born out of tragedy, just like the Newark riots were born out of a, an incident, those incidents of police brutality way back when. 
But I saw something different. I saw a group of people of all races, at all classes, professional, knowledge workers, students, people from less advantaged neighborhoods, all levels of education, band together, not just in Minneapolis, but in Chicago, in New York, and all across the United States and the world to say, we, and, and sometimes called the Black Lives Matter movement, sometimes other different rubrics, but saying, saying to the world, we can't tolerate this. Not just, not just instances of police brutality, which are horrific, um, but the racial and economic injustice and class division, class and racial division, which underpins it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think out of tragedy, sometimes we get a new perspective. And I think that combined with this rethinking that COVID brought about how and where we live. Give me some. It's it's a it's a I don't I hate to call it a so it's a sliver of optimism mm-hmm. uh, coming out of a horribly tragic and, and awful situation, which we should never have to endure again. Yeah, the pandemic, uh, this racial reckoning the economic collapse, it all forced many experts and and leaders to rethink and and to overhaul their theories of what a societal and and civic life should look like. But you were years ahead of this moment with a a mea culpa of your own. What was that journey like? It's so funny. (laughs) Thank you. And and folks, we didn't prep for this. We didn't like talk in advance. So, we sure didn't. <laughs> uh, no, we didn't. And that's exactly what I was thinking. When you asked that question, I was thinking, you know, I had already begun this introspection. Something was already, it's not just me. Something was already changing in our society. I'll tell you what happened. Um, two brilliant sociologists contacted me. I'm, a, I'm an urban geographer, urban planner. Some people call me an urban economist. I'm really not an economist. I play at economics, but... Um, I'm not a sociolo- an urban sociologist. I'm not an expert in crime, but a fellow named Rob Sampson at Harvard who wrote a brilliant book on Chicago. He was many, many years in Chicago. And one of his students, Pat Sharkey, who was at NYU then as now at Princeton, said, you know, Richard, you have been studying concentrated advantage, how these clusters of high-tech industries like the Silicon Valley or whatever emerge. And you've been understanding how clusters of wealth and of talents of universities go together. But we've been studying concentrated disadvantage, you know, as occurs in less advantaged parts of Chicago or New York or Boston. And we came to the conclusion that in a way they were mirror images reversed of urban life. What urban life today is, is a, a series of very small areas of concentrated advantage. You know where they are in Chicago, surrounded by much less larger spans of concentrated disadvantage that actually now head out into the suburbs and, of course, into rural areas. So that's what I set my mind to figuring out, how the middle had been eviscerated in our cities, the middle class, those strong middle-income neighborhoods. My dad worked in a factory, Mm -hmm. you know, and and was able to buy us a middle-class home in a suburb of New New Jersey, but that's gone today. So I really tried to understand in this book called The New Urban Crisis, this juxtaposition of very small areas of incredible wealth and advantage surrounded by much larger spans of disadvantage. And that was kind of my own reckoning with my own work and with urban life today. We are in this uh, technology age for the, uh, for the duration. What productive role, Richard, should big tech play in, in how cities function and how they grow? Well, the way, the way I think about this is not just big tech, but think about the University of Chicago, a sponsor of, of this conversation, the University of Illinois in Chicago Circle, these great universities and medical centers, your big companies in Chicago, insurance companies, banks, consultancies, airline companies, whatever, and then real estate companies and big tech companies. And I think the way I like to think about all of those is I call, we call them in the field anchor institutions. They are the places that anchor local economies. And, you know, what happened, and I, I think Chicago has been better than most at this, is that we, we, we came around to seeing companies as somebody we want to lure in with a big incentive, like the Amazon. I, I'm, I'm an Amazon customer. I get packages delivered for my kids every day. I think they have great customer service. But I don't think cities should be spending billions of dollars to attract an Amazon headquarters, or what they called HQ2. I think that anchor institutions, whether they're big tech companies or insurance companies or finance companies or, or universities, should be part of a solution. They should be throwing in with cities and actually helping to partner on the development of affordable housing, better pathways for economic opportunity. That's what I've devoted this phase of my career to, to saying that these anchor institutions need to see cities not as something they will extract from and take from or be given from, but as part of their of where they live. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Universities in Philadelphia, you know, have been a big part 
Drexel, the University of Pennsylvania, of rebuilding Western Philadelphia and come up with an inclusive strategy. In Newark, New Jersey, my hometown, Rutgers, Newark, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, would I want to single out a company, Mm -hmm. the Prudential Corporation, the insurance company. You know, it could have moved out of Newark during the terrible days of the 60s and 70s when Newark was a destitute place. But no, it hung in there and it invested in the city and invested in the community, invested in a collaborative anchor institutions and have helped to pull Newark up by its bootstrap. So I would expect big tech companies to be part of the solution rather than being part of the, the problem. This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons, and that is renowned urbanist Richard Florida from the University of Toronto. Today, he's helping us in our weekly effort to reimagine Chicago. Now, this series is a collaboration between Reset and the University of Chicago's Center for Effective Government. Coming up in about 10 minutes on Reset, we dig deeper into what post-COVID shifts are going to mean for downtown Chicago. All of those empty office buildings and the lunch spots that served downtown workers. So stay tuned for that conversation. Richard, for our Reimagine series, we took a comparative look at Toronto city government. Um, we learned a lot about how our mayoral systems and aldermanic systems are different. So when it comes to economic development or how Toronto approaches community investment, is there anything that stands out to you about what's working there or not working? Well, you know, I, I think the differences in Toronto, Toronto, I, I wouldn't want to emulate their weak mayor system of government. The fact that, you know, the premier of Ontario in one stroke of a pen, think about this, turned our, our city council from 40 some people to 25 people in a day without any input. So I, I think our structure has some issues, but I think there, there are two things or three things American um, Americans can learn from Toronto. One is Toronto has great urban schools. And that's because they're provincially funded. We don't have locally funded schools. So almost every kid in Toronto gets an, I wouldn't call it an equivalent education. Some richer neighborhoods can pay a little more and do things at the margin. And of course, they're private schools. But but basically, everyone of any racial or ethnic or class position gets an equivalent or analogous education. But then the University of Toronto, which is a gigantic university where I teach three campuses, 90,000 students, Almost every kid growing up in Toronto is able to get themselves admitted to the University of Toronto. So if you, if, you, if you go into any neighborhood in Toronto, you can find kids that went through the public school systems and are now in the University of Toronto. Secondly, we have much less violent crime. There is theft. There is burglary. There is they steal your car. You know, nuisance crime is in any urban area. Mm-hmm. But violent crime is substantially different. It, it's in a different planet. And then thirdly, although the system has come under crisis with COVID um, and, you know, Toronto's still in a a lockdown because of this, because there's not enough ICU beds, um, the public health system, the publicly supported health system means that everyone in Toronto has access to equivalent health care. So I think that means that you get a fairer city, a better city, warts and all. I think where Chicago really shines, and I'll tell you guys a story. I was on the board of our art museum, the the, um, AGO. The, it's called the Art Gallery of Ontario, AGO. Yes. And uh, before I came on the board, my, my fellow board members had done a trip, a board trip to Chicago. And they recounted a story to me, which I think the listeners will enjoy. And they said, what we learned in Chicago is that people who move to Chicago, business executives, are, are really made to make a commitment not just to their company, to the city. Very different in Toronto where this is not the case. And, and what they took away from that trip is that when a new executive comes to Chicago to be part of one of the big companies or when a new startup company is founded, you know, everyone's called together in one of their chamber of commerce like meetings. And it said, you know, you're going to be judged in Chicago, not just on how your business does and how much profit you make or how much your stockholders gain, but how much you commit to our city. And we're going to offer you, you know, in this meeting, six or seven board positions on community organizations and art gallery and art museum, the community activity at university then you're going to get to pick two and you're going to be involved in them and you're going to make contributions to them. So I think where Chicago really shines in a different way is the public private partnership where corporate executives and companies really are, there is pressure brought to bear in that business community to make a difference in your town, which mm-hmm. I think is a net good thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm from Toronto myself, Richard. So, um, so yes, I knew what the AGO was. I'm, I'm glad that you, you spelled it out for us though. Yeah. Um, and I can't help but see so many similarities between the two cities, between Toronto and Chicago, you know, the makeup of the cities, the population, 
where they're situated, the diversity here um, is just reminds me so much uh, of my hometown. Uh, but there is something that that strikes me um, over the last decade. Uh, I've read that you know people of color have left Chicago in massive numbers, especially African American people. What do you think could help stem that tide? Well, you know, Toronto is, you, you know this because you're from there. If, if folks listening, we don't consider ourselves in Toronto a melting pot. You know, my, my parents, my dad, Luigi, named us Richard and Robert, Italian Americans that didn't speak Italian in the home. Mm-hmm. In Toronto, there's the idea of the mosaic where you get to keep a bit of your culture, whether now you don't have African, whether you're a black Canadian, whether you're a you know Middle Eastern Canadian, whether you're Italian Canadian. And you get to keep your culture and add the new one. I think that's really important. Yeah, I'd only ever heard the term melting pot in reference to the U.S. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, of course, and I don't mean to say this, I mean, Toronto experienced most of its migration after the war, which means it was a relatively affluent society at the time that it got its new influx of African or Afro-Caribbean or Italian or Portuguese, or now it's, you know, it's really an Asian city, as you know, it's more of an Asian than an Indian city. So all of that means that immigration didn't bring the conflicts. I I do think though it is a fairer city and it it is a less, I mean, look, it's a segregated city. I'm not, it's an unequal city. If I said this, people in Toronto would say, no, don't sugarcoat this. Black Canadians don't do as well as Caucasian Canadians. That said, it doesn't compare to, to what's happened in Chicago. So I think it is a fair and juster city. By the way, just to add to that, um, back when Richard Daly was mayor of Chicago way back when, and David Miller was mayor of Chicago, and I first moved, uh, mayor of Toronto, and I first moved to Toronto, we actually had great hopes that we could do more things together as kind of, we, we kind of joked and called them the twin pillars of the Great Lakes, Chicago and Toronto on each end. Yeah. I'd love to see us get back to that. I'd love to see more comparison, more work together, more learning from one another. I, I thought it was a great idea, and I was going to be involved in that. And then, of course, Richard didn't run, and then David didn't run, and, and so it never happened. Well, let's look around the world for, for best, best practices um, in the interest of time. You wrote an op-ed, Richard, uh, about how Paris chose to leverage its COVID shutdowns to reimagine that city. So can you t- tell us more about what's happening there? Well, I'm worried. You know, I I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times several years ago, which I titled The Urban Revival is Fragile. Of course, the headline writers at the New York Times, being much better than me, titled it under my byline, The Urban Revival is Over. Quite a different and a little nuanced shift in wording. But but the point I made is that I think with the rise in urban crime, with the rise in urban inequality, with uh, now add COVID, accelerating that with COVID, You know, you were beginning to see an urban revival that happened over the course of the past decade or two could turn around. And I think we've seen some of that. I think it's really under threat. I really do. I think this is the first time in my life. And you're going to have this. You're going to talk about what's happening in the downtowns. I think this what's happening in the commercial corridors is really worrying. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's why I think what's happening in Paris is really interesting. Mayor Hildago has said, look, we have an opportunity to remake Paris not as a city where people live in a suburb and commute to a downtown and where cars overtake our streets, but she wants to make it walkable, bikeable, the seats, the streets safe for pedestrians. And the term urbanist used for this folks is called a 15 minute neighborhood. A French professor came up with this idea and the mayor embraced it. And the idea is that you do everything in your daily life. You shop, you take your kids to school, you go to work in general within a 15 minute bike or walk from your house. So you don't have a city with a suburbs and a downtown. You have a city of villages or a city of neighborhoods. Now, will that be 100 percent? No. But do you tilt the balance more from a city of separated work, live, shop to a city where life is more integrated? I think that's the idea. And so I think Paris has done a great job at Mm -hmm. that. And uh, I'd say that's one. There are many others, but I think that's a good one. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, as you know, the Biden administration and, and Congress, they are moving forward on this over two trillion dollar infrastructure plan, where should those investments go in order to truly make life better for often ignored Americans? Well, we're very lucky that last week I talked to a fellow named Steve Goldsmith, who was the mayor of Indianapolis, but he now is at the Kennedy School at Harvard, the equivalent of your own Harris School. I kind of think of Steve as the dean of mayors. He served under Republican President Bush. He served under President Obama. I kind of think of him as the dean of mayors, and we got to talking about this. And I think our biggest conclusion was don't spend it on the infrastructure of the past. 
Like, don't build more roads and tunnels and bridges and, and put more cars on the road. Build it on the infrastructure of the future and build, spend it on the infrastructure that can make us more inclusive. A lot of those roads not, not only destroyed the social fabric of our city, you know, they went through low-income neighborhoods and destroyed the, the community bonds and texture and cohesion. So stop that. I think, I think spend some of it to heal those communities, to go back and rebuild those communities and take those roads out, those highways that mowed down my, my, own, my, my father's boyhood home in Newark. They just mowed it right down in the old Italian ghetto. So begin to patch and stitch. I think, of course, we have to invest in, in providing good digital technology to all of our citizens, including our rural citizens who are, who are disconnected, um, making sure that everyone has access to digital technology they need to achieve. And, and I think just investing in better and stronger communities, uh, investing in infrastructure. And I think the Biden administration is talking about social infrastructure and child care. But making sure it's not just roads and bridges and highways and digital technology, but the kind of human infrastructure, educational, child care, poverty mitigation, economic opportunity that that we need to survive and thrive. By the way, you know, it looks tough this moment, but I'm actually more optimistic. Here's my little worry. My little worry is that you're going to come out of this COVID thing. And just like in the 1920s, we had the roaring 20s. We're going to look this summer at the roaring 2020s. You can already see people milling about Chicago and the beachfronts getting crowded. I just hope that we don't lose track of this idea that we should be a more inclusive society. Mm -hmm. I hope that we stay focused on that. I really, I really hope that we can stay focused and not only rebuild our economy and you know what I'm saying, get back to having a normal life, but keeping our eyes on the balls of being more inclusive with regard to class and race. And I hope we can stay focused on that. A little bit of optimism always helps. That is Richard Florida, urbanist and professor at the University of Toronto. His books include The Rise of the Creative Class, as well as The New Urban Crisis. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. No, it's a pleasure being with you. Uh, Thanks for having me. Want more context on the top issues of the day? Find the podcast, WBEZ's Reset, wherever you listen.